Okay. Good morning, everybody. So, um, Good morning in progress. I wonder who that person is who says recording in progress. It's like telephones a couple of decades ago. If you were to get a busy number or a number that doesn't exist, there would be somebody, some voice that would say, this number is no longer in service. Please make a note of it. Who is that person? Um, but in any case, so uh, just to reiterate, the rest of this, talk, um, this um, uh, lecture, series of lectures, it's now going to be computer science and a little bit tomorrow on the thermodynamics of computer science. So before making that transition, you guys have been basically um, uh, shotgun with a whole bunch of material coming at you from very many different directions. The way that we're going to actually schedule the remaining part is Gulje will be presenting some material on what are called deterministic fine automata this morning. So we're just waiting for her to be able to um, come down. And then I'll be presenting Turing machines this afternoon, Turing machines tomorrow morning, and then some of the thermodynamics of computational machines modeled as I was showing yesterday in terms of finite baths. But before going to all of that, as I was saying, you guys have had a whole bunch of stuff. Is it still okay to say you guys in a generic sense? You people, um, you human beings. Um, I've had a whole bunch of stuff thrown at you from very many different directions. So um, are there any questions? Are there any, um, uh, especially questions about the foundations, the fundamentals, the way that this extends all conventional um, uh, statistical physics, equilibrium statistical physics? Sorry? Did I hear from over on that side? OK, everybody. Is everything trivial? <laughs> Did you learn anything? Mas or menos. So, hey, don't laugh at my accent. <laughs> um, OK, so um, a little bit then. Um, of the idea of a deterministic uh, find automata um, up to Turing machines. Who here has heard about the Chomsky hierarchy? Just a little bit. No. Sorry? I have heard the name. Heard the name. OK. Anybody else? OK. So uh, Noam Chomsky, he's actually still alive, MIT professor. Um, quite an interesting guy. If you look at his Wikipedia entry right now, you'll see a lot of stuff. He um, basically revolutionized the entire field of linguistics. Of our, um, he was instrumental in our current understanding of how human beings actually generate language. Based upon that, um, his consideration of how human beings um, uh, generate language, generate sentences, he actually built a bunch of abstract models of what it means to actually generate a sentence, generate a string. These um, different machines are part of what's called the Chomsky hierarchy. So the simplest one, which we'll, you'll be hearing about first this morning, sorry. Are called thermodynamic are called deterministic finite automata. And then in increasing sophistication, there are other ones. There's what's called push-down automata and several others. And then you end up with Turing machines. Um, these have greater computational power. The way that you actually formalize computational power with these um, different machines in the Chomsky hierarchy is the following way. All of them take strings as input, strings of bits, for example. That's the input coming into the system. Everything OK? OK, um, so um, are you uh, going to be ready in just a second to present the? Yeah, can you give me a second to just go? Go for it, go for it. 
So the way that um, a computational power is measured with all of these systems is that you've got the machine, which usually has a finite number of uh, internal states, the states of the computational machine. It gets a string, there's a string of inputs as well, a tape, which has zeros and ones, and the machine basically examines sequentially positions on the tape. Up at the level of Turing machines, it can actually write to the tape. Back here, you're not allowed to write to the tape. Turing machines can also go backwards on the tape. Deterministic fine automata cannot go backwards on the tape. And there's this notion of a language that is recognized by the machine. So for example, deterministic automata, here's the automata. It has n internal states. One of them is the initial state. And then there's a set of them that are called accepting states. And what happens, it's quite simple. There's a sequence of bits that come in one after the other. So you have bit 0, bit 1, bit 2, dot, dot, dot. Every time a bit comes in, based on the current state of the machine, you have an update function which says, taking in a bit, I'll call it W sub Z, plus the current state of the machine, that just changes to the new state of the machine. And that's all that it does. This is a deterministic fine automata, as Gurdjieff will be elaborating. What happens is you send in this particular string of um, bits, and then it ends, the string ends at some point, and then you see, is the state one of the, quote, accepting states? If the answer is yes, you say that you accept that particular string, that word. If the answer is no, it's not an accepting state, then you don't. The language accepted by a fixed deterministic fine automata is the set of strings that it will accept. Okay, here's one of the um, very the fundamental concepts of computer science. For deterministic fine automata, it's very easy to construct. Well, it, it's not too difficult, let's say, to construct languages that are not accepted by any deterministic fine automata. No matter how many states, no matter how many um, accepting states and no matter what the update function is. Just to clarify, you could have all states be accepting states, but the language that's accepted by the automata, um, to have a deterministic automata recognize a particular language means that it will accept words in that language, but will not accept words that are not in that language. So you can't just make a system that accepts all states. Um, it accepts all strings by um, simply having every state be in the accepting state, okay? Notice if we look at this particular string here as a tape, Jacopo? Yes, yep, usually it's an infinite set. So for example, um, uh, right here, deterministic fine automata, notice that word finite. There's a finite number of states. That combined with the fact that you cannot go backwards and that you cannot write means that there are many, many languages that cannot be recognized by any deterministic fine automata. For example, we could have a language of palindromes. Palindromes are strings such that you um, uh, go forward and uh, you get a particular pattern and then the ending of it is the exact same pattern in reverse. For example, that's a palindrome. Okay? And the, you cannot build a finite automaton that can accept all palindromes. The reason is that palindromes can be arbitrary length. And the only way that you can actually um, keep track of whether we are right now recognizing a palindrome or not is based upon which state we're in. And there's a finite number of states, an infinite number of palindromes. So basic, and there's no trick, basically, 
that allows you to um, condense the, um, the question of am I right now scanning a palindrome or not down to just a single state, so you're screwed. There are other infinite languages that are accepted by um, uh, deterministic finite terms. These are called the regular languages. Now, um, in contrast, they make, as I was saying, they make only very, very small changes in a Turing machine, named after um, Alan Turing, um, which is to say that you can also, in um, the exact same scenario, but the um, computational machine can go backwards as well as forwards along the tape in the simplest version of a Turing machine. And most crucially, it can actually um, change. It can what's called write to the tape. It can overwrite a particular bit. Those two small changes make Turing machines as powerful as every single laptop in this room, actually far more powerful than any single laptop in this room. It's very easy now to recognize palindromes. If you folks um, all have Python interpreters or some such on your laptops. If you just write a short little program to recognize whether an arbitrary length string is a palindrome, you have just programmed a Turing machine that can recognize palindromes. Any of the normal computational languages that we use in our software, um, those are actually, uh, can all of them be implemented with Turing machines. So um, all of these you can actually say, what is the actual thermodynamics of a physical system that implements one of these computational machines from the Chomsky hierarchy? Which is what we'll be getting to a little bit tomorrow. But before getting there, one very, very important point I want to bang on about Turing machines. Um, I should have a soapbox I can climb up to because this is me getting on my soapbox, sort of um, pontificating. Um, there's something called the Church Turing thesis, which people may have heard of, which basically says that any function that is computable by any system, including the human brain, in an ill-defined sense, can be computed by a Turing machine. It basically says that anything that we can do with our brains can, in theory, be done with a Turing machine. For example, a Turing machine that would emulate down to the level of molecules every single neuron in our brains and run that forward, it would be able to exactly emulate whatever function our brain is calculating. Now, the crucially important thing, which is very, very tied up with, you may have heard of the notion of Kolmogorov complexity, is that there are strong limits on what Turing machines can do. You can create functions very easily, well, very easily in hindsight, that are very, perfectly well-defined, and they are not computable by any Turing machine. So what this means is that modern Mathematics, modern computer science, has been able to construct mathematical objects, in fact, an infinity of mathematical objects, which are beyond the capability of human beings to compute. That strikes me as one of the most fundamental philosophical insights ever generated by humanity. And the details of exactly how it's computable or not computable are extraordinarily rich. Okay. Kildra? Every time someone mentions church thesis, mm -hmm. uh, I want to still point out, for example, this, this, this sentence, for example, that I don't know if the brain functions can be implemented by this Turing machine and so on and so forth, but in theory, um, Chris Moore's work on how you know, dimensionality actually causes a problem for physical, real dynamical systems to implement Turing machines. Can you also point that out? For example, dimensionality. I'm not sure. Like it's, it's actually, I would say it's the opposite. For example, I can construct a Turing machine just using three body motion in the solar system, where the input tape is essentially given by the positions in phase space of those three bodies. Chris Moore, actually, some of his early papers shows how to use the Baker's map and so on. And there's lots of people. Most recently, Naato Shureshi has actually um, got a very nice paper in which he um, constructs a physical system involving spin glasses and shows that whether that um, a property of quantum spin glasses, when you do the quantum mechanical formulation, um, an important property, depending on the details of the spin system, is whether it what's called thermalizes or not. 
And he constructs a very simple Hamiltonian, he and his collaborators, in showing that it's not computable in general whether such a um, spin system will thermalize. So I would say that actually raises very profound questions about does the universe, in some sense, calculate, do computations that we cannot? It's the subject of lots of controversy. People are still fighting over these things, and there's no clean resolution. This is all tied up a lot as well with Gödel's incompleteness theorem. As Gülge is emphasizing, um, the church thesis, church Turing thesis, is actually a little bit, it's very vague. It's almost explicitly vague. It's, it's actually almost a, a dictionary definition. It's saying whenever we talk about what is computable by us human beings in general, the, the thesis is it can always actually be implemented by a Turing machine. That, you can accept that or not accept that. Roger Penrose famously said that, no, he thinks that due to quantum gravity, the brain is actually stronger than Turing machines. I mean, even, sorry, sorry, I'm interrupted, but I mean, before quantum gravity, there are, again, like so many more interesting issues, right? I mean, what, it, what does it mean to implement a Turing machine it has, that has an infinite tape and So what you would normally system. do in a physical system, you have to consider a physically extensible tape is the way. So what she's talking about now is the fact that um, Strictly speaking, this tape is actually infinite, and in the real universe, you don't have um, infinite tapes, but it suffices to actually say that the tape is finite, but it's extensible. That's exactly the way that your computer, for example, runs, can emulate a Turing machine, is basically, it's only got a finite memory, but you say that, well, if it ever is going to run out of memory, it can just go out to the cloud and get other memory, and if you just assume that it can go out to the cloud and get other memory for an arbitrarily large amount of memory, which of course is not exactly true, but if we were to make that um, kind of assumption in that kind of a universe, then the computer could emulate everything that we can. So the question then becomes, that kind of a universe, which does have this difference from us, in that uh, the Amazon Web Services or, or the Microsoft's version of the cloud or whatever, is actually infinite in those other universes rather than being finite in our universe, does that have any um, actual consequences for the fundamental nature of the universe? Anyway, this is just a, um, uh, a very, very brief, quick overview of um, what we'll be getting to in the uh, remaining uh, two days' worth of lectures. And as I'm emphasizing, the um, thermodynamics of these things changes drastically some of the computer science. If rather than looking at things like accepting or not accepting or Kolmogorov of complexity looks at things like the shortest input string that generates a given output, if you instead worry about thermodynamic quantities, you get a whole bunch of what can be viewed as corrections to Kolmogorov of complexity, for example. And if you do the, um, uh, instead if you do things in terms of the finite bath formulation of, quantum of computational machines, which Gurdjieff and I are working on together, then you can actually get things like fluctuation theorems that apply to computers. So that's a very, very quick overview of where we'll be going for, the, uh, for these next two so days. David, David so mm -hmm. I have a question. I don't know how silly it is, but so you could think of a code that transforms a, a string of bits into a sequence of words as uh, uh, a de deterministic finite automata. Well, the deterministic finite, you have to be careful about the definition. Certainly when you're doing the thermodynamics, it becomes very much a slippery issue. But this definition of a DFA, there's no outputs. <clears throat> there's only inputs. The strings come in, you jump around yeah. the states, you accept or not. You can also de um, define something that's very, very closely related and that some people with confusing language would also call a DFA, in which for every single state transition, something is emitted. So yeah, it depends on the precise detail. You think of a code as a tree, right? Um, you start I, at the state at the top, mm -hmm. and then depending on whether you get a zero or a one, you go on mm -hmm. one side or on the other. Yep. And then you have terminal uh, states, which yep. are the accepting mm -hmm. states. Yep. Um, or accepting or not, yeah. Uh, well, yeah, okay, so, uh, but couldn't you think of a code as a, speci a special kind, I mean, seen in this, in this way, couldn't you see a, a, 
uh, code as a special type of deterministic uh, finite. Oh, in that sense, it is. And the, and the bits coming in are what's going down the tree. Exactly. And so, for example, if the strings were all what's called prefix-free, which um, Gilje described yeah. what that is earlier on, then you would actually know it's a binary tree and things like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and it would be directed tree yeah. in that particular case. So. Yeah. You can actually even, okay, so what you said is, okay, something else, what I'm going to say is sort of like complementary. Um, even, for example, you can think of it as a device that sort of takes like these binary strings and sort of encodes it in, in, in a different way. For example, can I? Um, you wanted to take over? Do you have your laptop up? Yeah, no, not to just, yeah. I don't know, whatever you tell me, you're the boss, but... Um, yeah, so like, for example, this one. Um, for example, when you have some scheme like that, okay, let's do this as well. Let's say that you're starting from this state. Where am I holding this? I don't know. Okay, let's start that, that you're starting from here and you're reading this one and then you're, you're reading this one and you're reading this one. Because your machine is deterministic, what you can do is actually also keep track of these states, for example, Q0, Q1, Q2, or like, I don't know, write it in terms of A, B, C, and sort of like. So those would be states within the computational like machine. Yeah. This is actually, interestingly, some of the things that people can use the finite automaton for, for example, encoding. Like, for example, sliding block codes in information theory, they, they use it to encode information. You're up. Okay. Okay, apologies. I had a technical problem with my computational machine, so like this one, not that one. So um, I guess that's gonna work. Okay, well, I'm gonna take one minute. Doop, doop, doop. How are you doing? Are you are you fine? How's it going? Yeah. Everyone's happy. Everyone thinks that this is the most excited part of the course. Yeah? No? Okay. Um, okay. Zoom. Come here. Almost there. Ah. <clears throat> Zoom, join. Oh, okay. Okay. Matteo, what is the passcode? <laughs> six, six? Four, seven, nine. Nine, three. Okay, thank you. Okay, just before starting, I want to emphasize something. Um, Recording in progress. Okay, thank you. Yes, now let's also share. I think so. Yeah, yes. Okay, it's always a risky thing to do, but this is not going to be on, I mean, the, the details of this kind of things that we're going to be talking about these are not going to be on the exam, at least for this part, like the finite automaton and so on and so forth and theorems related. So the, this actually introduction to DFAs um, isn't something where, where we are going to be, for example, like um, talking about this, oh, the oldest intellectual and just like this uh, interesting aspects of this gold mine that goes by the name of the theory of formal, like this uh, finite automata, sorry, formal theory of automata. 
but we're going to be just touching upon why we should be interested in this, okay? Then David is going to actually sort of like um, come back and talk about Turing machines and algorithmic complexity and so on and so forth. And we're just going to give this sort of basic idea and the setup and sort of what I want to do is to sort of incite, I don't know, just fuel your intuition about this topic, okay? So that we can see what, where we can use physics and stochastic thermodynamics, okay? Okay. So first of all, just this um, question of just, I think, clarify some things. Why do we actually see, for example, something as thermodynamics even relevant to computer science? Okay, so this is Dreck. This person is a clever person. He's one of the titans of physics, I would say, okay? He's not a philosopher, but um, so like, we are gonna take him serious when he says that there is no information without representation. So. When you read something like that, maybe it just doesn't click instantly, but you can actually insert some dynamics inside and try to think about what information processing would mean, okay, if there is no information without representation. So one of the things that we define computation is basically the processing on info of information, okay? So if this holds, we can basically, I think, think that there is no information processing without the manipulation of representation, okay? This is actually something that you can find, um, I don't know about this, like philosophy of computer science also, and so on and so forth, but this guy is a physicist, so we care about that. So um, now, there are two different fields that of interest to us, but also just like mainly super, super, super interesting that actually talks about information processing in terms of different um, representations, different ways of representations. So in computer science, what you have is a representation of information with more of a logical nature, right? This makes sense, this makes total sense. Uh, and in physics, this is more of a material nature, okay? And so one of the things that we see, observe, is actually that in these, these both fields, they actually have this you know, overlap between the way that they approach the information processing and representation in the sense that both fields reason about behaviors, computer science, operational systems, and so on and so forth, and physics is just dynamical systems. And both exist because constraints do. If you think about computer science, at its heart, it's just a... Um, it's just a field that actually is sort of like developed to understand how do you solve problems, okay? In, on so many levels, how efficiently you solve them, but how, how can you solve problems and so on and so forth. And when it comes to physics, well, things happen because they have constraints. If you have suspects about this, Murray Gellman has some good arguments about that, okay? So what we are gonna be concentrated on is the problem of resources. So in computer science, there's this really interesting field called I was like, am I tripping? Ahmed. <laughs> <I'm like, so. laughs> Ahmed, can you please switch off your microphone? Hello? <laughs> so maybe, okay, thank you. Okay, so coming back to this one, um, computer science and physics, both are concerned with resources. And most interesting field, I think, I think this is a personal opinion of computer science is, at least at this point, it's computational complexity which is asking this main question of, okay, we are curious about these problems that we can solve, but even beyond that, we are curious if we can solve these problems efficiently if we are provided some computational machine, for example, a deterministic finite automata or Turing machines that come with different architectures and different constraints and so on and so forth. And basically, computational complexity itself if you ask a computer scientist, it refers to what is now called the resource complexity, which and the resources come in terms of like this time and memory and space that you are give, that is given to you when you want to carry out a computational task. Okay, so in thermodynamics, well, we've been talking about all of these resources, for example, in terms of like this energetic cost to carry out a thermodynamic process or a sustain an equilibrium steady state and so on and so forth. So we can have this sort of like this baby little intuition set up to maybe look out for analogies between computer science and thermodynamics, okay? So, uh, 
models of computation to actually ask even, you know, start asking this question of oh, what we can compute and sort of what is, what is something, what is an architecture that allows us to compute some certain set of problems and so on and so forth. We need to introduce models of computation. This is a model of computation. This is the most basic model of computation that you can consider. This is a model of computation where you can get as universal as possible, okay? So um, we are gonna be sort of like introducing this, you know, the basic definitions of DFAs and we are gonna be talking about one complexity measure of DFAs that we are gonna be maybe touching upon tomorrow and so on and so forth. But why do we need models of computation? First of all, computers are really complex structures to talk about. If I give you a problem, how are you going to model a computer? What you're taking, I mean, what you're doing is basically taking this into an abstract form and developing these models that we are gonna, again, introduce in one slide or something like that in a more formal manner. So computer scientists started to, again, tackle this question of how, what can you compute and how can you compute this thing by actually uh, now what it is called as a comp computability theory, okay? So this one, I think, okay, historical, why didn't I write that? Again, if you ask a computer scientist, he or she will say that, okay, computability theory is like a research field that lived between 1930s and 1950s, but actually the roots go even, you know, like just like to Leibniz. Um, so Leibniz, uh, okay, interesting person. I think he, he, like he, he was living in a pipe dream, like thinking about the best of the possible worlds, but also just basically saying things like, oh, well, we have to calculate and we have to, we have an intellect, okay? So in his writings, he, he's like a complete philosopher actually in this sense. If we have a human intellect and if we are doing mathematics, well, the whole world itself can be actually seen as this like this product sort of like the, you know, like this reflection of the human intellect and we can automize the whole world and we can automize mathematics, okay? So we can automize our expressions or the representations of this physical reality and so on and so forth. So he's one of the first people to our records who told about just sort of like asking this problem of how can we automate our mathematical expressions, okay? Um, when I say mathematical expressions, I'm meaning, for example, proofs. But of course, I'm not talking about proofs because Leibniz didn't go that right. So Leibniz failed, we know that. But in 20th century, there was a very bright mathematician. We all know him. Interesting guy, again, all of them are guys. But um, so yeah, Hilbert, okay? So he was thinking that because this, you know, the formal uh, theory of logic was also sort of, you know, developed in 20th century, he was thinking that mathematics was a perfect, and in his words, a complete structure where you have these formal arguments in mathematics that, are, that can be always verified in mathematics itself, okay? So what Hilbert wanted to do was actually, you know, take this idea of using mathematics to talk about mathematics, okay, meta, in a way, and to basically prove that, oh, everything in mathematics, you don't have to go out, but it can be proven by mathematics. Even though it's an axiomatic formal system where you are basically an axiom by definition, it's an axiom where you come up with definitions you're not proving, but he believed that it's a perfect system. And so he posed some set of questions and it is awaiting to be solved and so on and so forth. And then there was a, an even more interesting person. I think one of the most interesting people that lived in the 20th century, George Goodall. He said, no, 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 no. There is something called an incomplete theorem. We call it like that right now. And he showed that mathematics is limited. Its expressive power is limited. So there are some arguments, mathematical expressions in mathematics that you cannot prove in mathematics, in your formal system, okay? Because basically, because you have axioms and so on. So, and then, okay, we get all actually crushed some people's hearts and so on and so forth, made people depressed. But then there was still one fundamental question open that actually sort of, you know, it was a hope, in, it was of a hope inspiring nature, which is basically, okay, we know that we cannot prove everything in mathematics by mathematics, but, we can prove some stuff, right? We can verify some mathematical expressions. Mm -hmm. So the remaining problem was that, can we actually you know, develop some, now introducing the words algorithms, for everything that we can prove in mathematics? Can we do that? 
Well, it's a good question. Turing said no. Okay, so um, so this happened in 1930. So this guy, I think, he came around in 1930. And so this, this is the sort of like marking the start of the computability theory in a formal sense. And this guy actually published his paper on this universal machines in 1936. And after that, like about 15 years, people produced some results. But then the question changed. So the computability theory was interested in what can you prove, what can you compute, and so on and so forth. But people started to get curious about this question of, you know, like how well you can compute something, how efficiently you can compute something if I provide you a computational machine, okay? So this is how like where all the beautiful things in life reside in, like P equals MP problems and so on and so forth. So um, we say that um, going back to the models of computation and why we need such abstraction, um, this is a model of computation and this is the most basic model of computation, but this is a bit boring, okay? You have some states, we will see it and you jump and so on and so forth. But as, for example, David mentioned, Turing machines are incredibly capable structures. So, for example, in this class, why are we even like interested in deterministic finite automata? So there are actually, I think, a way to see this, you know, these kind of deterministic finite automata and so on and so forth, is that it's like a microcosm of computer science, of these models of computational machines, because you can actually ask some questions in a formal manner and get your answers in a formal manner really well. For example, one of these questions is that, does non-determinism result in efficiency? We are gonna be actually talking about the deterministic finite automata and non-deterministic finite automata, and we are gonna be talking about this. So um, this is some question that we can ask and get some really nice answers to. And computability and complexity, do they have some relation or for example, they, do they have some really tight relations? And for example, we will see that an undeterministic finite automata, a deterministic finite automata, is in this sense that accepts the same language. They do not differ in the way that they compute, so they sort of like belong to the same computability class. But in the complexity, in the efficiency, in the way that they compute, how they compute, they differ, okay? So this is something that we learned. And then we are gonna be talking, we are gonna be emphasizing that if you want to, um, for example, let's say that if you're coming up with a set of equivalent finite automata that actually accepts the same one language, you want to, for example, I mean, just like as a logical human being, you want to prefer the minimal one, right? The one that comes with this minimal number of states, the one that doesn't tire you when you run a computation on that machine and so on and so forth. But we're going to be seeing, even before thermodynamics, it comes with some computational cost to get this minimal deterministic finite automata. And, well, um, it's rewarding in the sense that if you're like a multidisciplinary person and you're looking for some interesting stuff out there, it, it, it gives you Nobel Prizes. Um, so this is, um, so the 2011, I think this, this is something really interesting. That's, I don't know if it's relevant for you, but I think it's really interesting. So. Um, one of the things that you can do by um, finite automata is that you can find patterns in the data sequences and some people actually used it as a mathematical basis to identify patterns in quasi-crystals, okay? So I give you, I don't know, like this lattice structure, okay? They took this lattice structure, encoded it in strings, fed it into finite automata. So they take this, basically you're having this physical structure and encoding it in, it, uh, in, a, in a finite automata and you're trying to predict the all other possible crystal structures and so on and so forth, okay? Yeah, so that's one thing. And then I think this is the most important thing. We talked about so many things, but this is the most important thing. So is, does it sound familiar, for example, what David depicted here? You're in a state, something happens, you read a string, you process something, and then you jump to another state. You're basically going through some, for example, trajectory, it almost sounds like, right? So it might be some canonical model to actually start discussing some computational aspects. Right? Does it, does it make sense? Oh, I'm failing so hard. Okay, so now, 
formal definition will come in a second. But what we're having is basically a state diagram of uh, oh, the arrows. You don't see the arrows, right? OK. There are arrows, OK? I want you to imagine that. These guys, they are placed on arrows. OK, so this is an arrow. This is the transition symbol. OK, so um, when we want to represent the finite automata, what we're doing is basically introducing a state diagram. OK? And in this state diagram, we are assuming that there is some set of states, OK? Now we start to talk about the architecture of this computational machine, OK? There are some states, and you're mostly assuming that there is a fixed start state, OK? That makes sense. And then, as David mentioned, there are some except states, OK? Where you basically start boop, 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 jumping between states, and then when you visit, when you come to a, um, come to a state, if you stop processing some, you know, like um, an input that's given to you, this is, an ex uh, this is an exact state. And then you have, of course, some transitions because, I mean, it's almost trivial. If you're not jumping from one state to another, you will not be able to even process some inputs. You're not going to be able to talk about computation. And the, yeah, it, it will come in the formal definition as well, but there's an alphabet that actually basically allows you to store these strings. It defines which strings that actually can be seen in these state transitions, OK? So yeah, input is a finite string. Again, um, you should remember it from this one. And you're putting this, feeding this finite string into your finite automata. And your output is going to be like an accept or reject. And how do we define computation in such a basic model? Again, it's the simplest model of computation. You're, per, uh, you're feeding strings. This, this guy over here, it starts reading, for example, from Q0, it starts reading one symbol at a time and makes a transition by reading this symbol, OK? That composes a part of a string, a component. It's a component of a string. And basically, when the string is actually sort of like coming to an end, which what this guy does is that if it's in an except state that is formally defined previously, like initially defined, initially fixed, then it will stop by accept, like an accept message, or it will reject it if it's not in an accept state when you start, uh, when you finish reading the string, okay? Okay, so this is the sort of mathematical formal definition of a deterministic finite automaton five tuple, list of five components. This is like, um, just to describe, this is a finite automaton. I think this is like the most regular um, symbol that we are using. So Q, finite set of states. And this one, yeah, is just this, right? Okay. And this, this sigma, it's a finite alphabet. For example, now what we have here is a binary alphabet. And this guy here is a transition function. So what this guy does is that, so do you, you see that Cartesian product of Q and sigma, and it basically tells you that you're in a state, and you read a symbol, and this maps you to a new state. OK, so this is why, how we define a transition function. And Q0 is a start state, and K is a set of accepting state. So this is basically the thing that defines this setup that we call to be this deterministic finite automaton, OK? <clears throat> Again, yes, as David introduced, we use this term a language, OK? Oh, before that, OK, maybe I should put, yeah, I should have probably put it here. But um, anyways, so omega to denote a string and a string is basically, a set of string is, for example, it can be written as this. Bop, 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 bop. So this is one string. This is another one, and so on and so forth. So we define a language that is recognized by a DFA to be the set of strings that it accepts, or recognizes. We also use the word recognizes. So accepting, again, means that you're feeding the string into the DFA. And when the string is like over, so you are processing the uh, final component, this final symbol on the string, if you're in an accept state, you accept that. If you're in a reject state, uh, if you're not in an accept state, you're rejecting that. 
So, so this, this definition is clear, right? Yes, okay, great. Okay, and again, just like as a, as a formal definition of this thing, for the finite automata, we say that if every language that is recognized by a finite automata, we call it to be a regular language, okay? This is something that you can check for yourself. Just like palindromes, for example, if you want to write down this kind of a language and construct a finite automaton that recognizes this language, you are going to fail because there is no finite automata that recognizes this language because this is not a regular language. Well, this is a regular language. You can try to do that, but it's not really important for our purposes right now. It is more of like, um, I don't know, um, Formal theory of automata 101 kind of a thing, like and if you're interested and you can do that. So, okay. So in these examples that we saw, for example, just like just like this one, what we had was the following. You're in a state, okay? You're reading a symbol and you're arriving into another state. So if you know that, for example, you read that symbol most recently, and you're in this, you're ending up in this state, then you know where you came from, right? So it's like you can reverse this transition function. Okay? What happens if we actually sort of say, oh, let's say that not each state has this unique transition that is, you know, that, that describes this state jump from one state to another, but there is some then determinism involved. So for example, when P goes back to itself, it might go back to itself by reading zero, the processing the symbol zero, or processing the symbol one. Okay? So this is what we call, so this kind of structures are called to be non-deterministic finite automata. So one of the, I think, most important points is that, okay, let's say that this is, okay. Determinist, what is going on? Deterministic finite automata and non-deterministic finite automata. One of the things that people tried to see was, for example, again, as we described this slide number two or something like that, if you actually introduce some non-determinism in your computational to your computational machine, um, what happens to the languages that you can recognize? So in a sense, for example, this was the problem of computability, right? What happens to the problems that you can solve? We are not talking about how efficient that you can solve this um, problem, but basically just what language, which problem, okay? So turns out um, any DFA, of course, it was a bit trivial here, it can be seen as a special kind of a non-deterministic finite automaton where you're basically imposing this condition that transition function takes you from one state to another, like exactly one state. So you know if you read one symbol, you know where you're gonna be ending up, and so on and so forth, so you can trace back where you came from. Um, and conversely, one thing that you can see is that for every NFA, the fi uh, non-deterministic finite automaton, you can find a DFA so that it recognizes the same language, so that it accepts the same very identical set of strings, okay? So this suggests that NFAs are not really more like computationally capable than DFAs. So they are like this, you know, this, this sort of, um, at least speaking on the computability level, they're almost the same. Not one other is more capable than the, one, the uh, uh, remaining one. But of course, there are some complexity issues involved. So when we are trying to come up with something interesting in our computer designs, but we're preferring is like the, uh, for example, inclusion of non-deterministic finite automata and designing non-deterministic finite automata and so on and so forth, okay? So this was the uh, one of the problems that we pointed out again in slide number two, the relations between computability and complexity. Yes? Mm -hmm. Oh, this is not, there is no probability here. This is just non-deterministic. This is not stochastic or probabilistic. Computer science is, okay. is non-deterministic. 
just when you've got all possible future trajectories, see what happens on any of them. Yeah. Um, of course, there is probability introduced, then, but then it's called a probabilistic finite automata, but not, we're not going to be talking about that. But it's, yeah, it's a small extension. It's just, um, yeah. So one thing that is of interest to us is this definition of, even before coming to that, so remember, we talked about, for example, having a computational machine such as a finite automaton as minimal as possible, right? Because, for example, I give you some strings and you're processing these strings, and let's say that you have two DFAs, okay, DFA like M and M prime, and it has three states, and it processes these strings, and that is given by some language L. And let's say that it accepts this language in the sense that like, it recognizes this language as we defined just a moment ago like in a formal manner. And this has, I don't know, 20 states. OK? I give you these two computational machines, and you want to sort of like, I don't know, do some uh, pattern analysis and so on and so forth. Which one do you prefer? And I give you a finite time to carry out this computation. Just, just super trivial. It's not even a question. Yes, you know the answer. Any idea? OK, so I give you a language, like a set of strings. OK, and I give you two deterministic finite automata that, uh, that accepts this language, so that recognizes the strings of that language, OK? And so, for example, the way that we define computation was that I'm giving you some strings, you're processing these strings, and you're accepting or rejecting, and so on and so forth, right? And I'm asking this question of if these, for example, one of these automata have the, uh, like it comes with three states and the other one comes with, let's say, 20 states or like 500 states or something like that. And I give you a finite amount of time to carry out a computation in the sense of processing strings and so on and so forth. And you want to sort of like, I don't know, for example, do you want to do either pattern sequencing, pattern anal analysis, or you want to basically identify the structure of the DFA. So which one do you prefer to you know, run the computation on? Exactly. Exactly. Because? Because when you're designing computers, this is something that you prefer, right? Make everything as minimal as possible. Everyone loves efficiency and so on and so forth. So we're going to be talking about this minimal size DFAs. We want to keep the Sorry, number. But in terms of computational time, they should be exactly the same. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, this so is why. It's what, just mm -hmm. that uh, the second one is a little bit more redundant. Exactly. You don't want to have redundancy. Yeah. Like if you, for example, if I, I mean, we're not actually um, using finite deterministic finite automata in computers, but there are some elements in our computers that implement deterministic finite automata. So if you, when we, for example, even for just like pure engineering aspects, if you want to um, increase this efficiency of our computers, one of the things that engineers do is to keep, try to keep like this number of states, so to say, um, as low as possible. Yes. Yeah. So um, uh, building on um, uh, the, the comments that, that both of you just made. Um, so for example, right now, um, anybody who's running a compiler, the compilers, uh, modern compilers, in the optimization step, they use um, deterministic final automata. If anybody ever remembers um, in their past or perhaps present, you use Unix, the regular expression checkers that uh, look for regular expressions. The regular expression is precisely defined as the uh, set of words in a language accepted by finite automata. Concerning um, uh, the definition of uh, going, um, the importance of minimal number of states, um, that in the case of a Turing machine, that is what people will identify with the complexity of an output string is going to be the minimal size of the input string such that you compute that output string. And when I give my uh, presentation on Turing machines in what, like 15 minutes? I, 10 minutes. 10 minutes, okay. Um, uh, then I'll be talking about that. You can define the complexity of a finite automaton as the n number of states in, oh, sorry, the complexity of a language 
as the number of states in the minimal automaton that actually accepts that language, which is very similar. Um, it's like a finite automaton version of a Komogorov complexity for Turing machines. In contrast to the case with Turing machines, where there are these hugely profound um, uh, open questions, like whether p equals np. By the way, the n in np is non-deterministic in exactly the sense that Gilja was introducing the term. All of those questions are open. They're, um, you, you solve that, your fame is instantaneous and will last forever. Those have all actually been solved, the analogous questions for deterministic finite automata, which is the only reason that it's not an active, ongoing um, field of research. But what that means in terms of stochastic thermodynamics is that deterministic finite automata provide us a sandbox in which we know actually the answers to all the computer science questions, and we can see how those answers to the computer science questions relate to answers to the thermodynamic questions. We can see the connection between the computer science properties of things like minimal number of states and things like the minimal amount of, of entropy dissipation or whatnot. So in any case, sorry for the, uh, diet, for the um, monologue. No, that was super helpful, I think. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, that's, I think, the, oh, mostly the um, last part that he, basically where he talked about the why we would be using stochastic thermodynamics. We would be using stochastic thermodynamics by sort of basically we're seeing this uh, fact that computer science already is done with, mostly done with deterministic finite automata as an opportunity for investigation from a physics perspective. Because we know at least what we are dealing with from the computer science perspective. All the problems are, most, mostly the problems are decidable, unlike the Turing machines where you have an incredible amount of undecidability when you consider problems. So you're good to go with, for example, a, a, a model that is sim as simple as deterministic finite automaton. So again, considering this problem of minimal size, by the way, maybe I should actually give this kind of a, yeah, thing um, first, yeah, before talking about why we, why we would care about that. So when you consider finite automaton, and also like in general in computational machines, there are two central um, computational complexity issues or measures of interest. And one of them is just like the main, you know, like this, it's lying at the heart of computational complexity theory um, from the, you know, like this computer science perspective, which is like time, memory, space, I don't know, circuit depth, and blah, 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 and all these cool computational cla complexity classes. And so this is one of them. And the other one is descriptive complexity. And it comes with many different measures. It's a, it's, it's a bit like a yeah, crazy sort of thing. But size complexity is a measure of descriptive complexity. And what is size complexity? Size complexity is basically something that is defined in this most simple way possible. Again, I give you, I mean, I'm going to go back and do this formally, but I give you two different DFAs, different DFAs in the sense that, let's say that they have different number of states, but they both accept the same language, I mean the same set of strings, okay? So they are computationally equivalent. So we call these kind of DFAs that accept the same set of strings to be equivalent DFAs, okay? But we are considering equivalent DFAs that come with different number of states, and the size complexity is defined as this um, minimal, okay, maybe, Jesus Christ, I'm sorry, I'm super tired, I had a, like, a, like a physical problem before the lecture, so I might, I'm getting super distracted. Um, is it size complex of a set of strings, so as Gilda is emphasizing, um, uh, there's an infinite number of DFAs that will accept any particular language that is accepted by any DFA. If I've got a language, a set of strings, that is accepted by one DFA, you can construct actually an infinite set of DFAs that will also accept exactly that same language. So they're computationally equivalent. And so the size complexity of a language is the num uh, and that is a regular language that is accepted by some DFA is the number of states in the DFA that has the smallest number of states that actually accepts that particular language. So that's the size complexity.
And yeah, so there's a theorem um, in, yes, formal uh, theory of automata, my whole neural theorem, where you basically prove that if I give you a set of equivalent DFAs that recognize or accept the same set of strings, same language L, we know that for sure for each regular L language L that we can consider, there is a unique minimal size complexity DFA. For example, if I give you like this language of the set of binary strings that are divisible by three, you know that it has three states. I think it's just this one. Oh yeah, it's, it's this one on, on, the, on the right one. Or this one that we saw here, okay? But you can construct some other DFAs. For example, the one on the left one, is like coming with a higher number of states, right? And still recognize in the same language. You can see that it's recognized the same language, by the way, just as a, I don't know, um, when I put it on the Slack channel, just sort of like track these state transitions, okay? And then you will see that they are accepting or rejecting the same set of strings. So they are equivalent in this computational sense, okay? But to actually keep track of this formally, this kind of an equivalency, we are introducing two different equivalency relations. One of them is over the language, so the set of strings that we are feeding into any kind of a DFA, okay? And one of them is over the DFAs themselves. So we are starting with the first one. So this is the definition of this first equivalence relation. So basically, I give you a language that is defined over, let's say, a binary alphabet, okay? And I give you a pair of strings in this language, okay? And we say that they're equivalent with respect to this language. I think this is the crucial point, with respect to the language, okay? If they satisfy this condition for each string that you can consider. So when I give you an equivalence relation like this, it's incredibly abstract. Does it make super sense to you? Like, can you imagine it without actually imagining a finite automata that processes these strings? Exactly, yeah. So, but, but still this is useful. And we say that this defines an equivalence relation because if you want, you can check it. It's reflexive, transitive, symmetric. So this is how we define equivalence relations. And this suggests that because we have equivalence relations that is defined over a language, we can construct what is called an equivalence class, okay? And equivalence class of a string is basically the set of strings that is identical or equivalent, I mean, equivalent to it in the sense that, mm -hmm. Sorry, uh, so to... Concatenation. Sorry? Concatenation of the strings. Okay. Yes, exactly. Okay, and so this is all good, but it's so abstract without introducing any kind of a computational machine because, I mean, I'm giving you basically a set of strings and and this kind of an equivalence relation, but why? So one thing that we want to ask is that even in a simple machine as DFAs, if two strings are not equivalent, we want to be able to distinguish them. If we're not able to distinguish them, we cannot compute with these DFAs. Remember how we defined computation for the DFAs. We are feeding the strings, we are processing the strings, we are given an output of like accept or reject. So if these DFAs cannot distinguish the strings that are not equivalent, basically the strings that are not ending up in, um, like for example, you have, let's say you have a string U and it's ending in, in an accept state. And there is some V that is ending in reject state. And you need to be able to distinguish them. They're not gonna belong to the same equivalence class because they are not going to be satisfying this property. So now, building on this, we are defining another equivalence relation. So this is an equivalence relation over the language or with respect to language, and this is an equivalence relation with respect to finite automata itself. And we define it in the following way. So let's say that you're starting from your Q0 start state, okay? And you process the string U, okay? And in another like trial or run of your computer, like the finite automata, 
Again, you start from Q0, star state, but now you process the string V. And what we would like to say is that if processing the string U and processing this string V take you to the same state, then these guys are equivalent. OK? Strings are equivalent. Because you cannot distinguish it. Mostly this makes sense because deterministic finite automaton is, it doesn't come with memory, right? So for example, I don't know what, what it is. Let's say that one one, I guess, I don't know, or something like that. So you start from this one, you go here, and you go here, and you go here, back here. So one zero zero. Okay? Or you just read this one. So you go here. So these strings, these two strings, are equivalent to one another. Because when you read them, you end up in the same state. Okay? Okay, but so here is one problem um, that we need to consider. Is this equivalence over language? It's sort of like, is it identical to equivalence over the computational machine, over the DFA itself? No, not exactly. So we can, we can actually discuss that. But this is, yeah, this is something that is really important. If you have, first to start with, if you have equivalence over your DFAs, then you definitely have equivalence over your language. OK? Because language is basically something from the reverse perspective, like the reverse direction, something that we can define as the set of strings that are accepted by the DFA. So you know that if you process strings and you end up in the same states of the DFAs, then, and you have this equivalence over the DFAs, then you have equivalence over the language. Or I think in the, in the same way, but this is, yeah, contrapositive. So you, if you do not satisfy the language equivalence, then you cannot satisfy the machine equivalence. OK? So yep. So building on this, what we come up with is an argument that suggests that each equivalence class that is defined over the strings that require a different state, the existence of a different state in your DFA. OK? This is basically to keep track of the fact that there is a DFA that recognizes a language, and you need to sort of like have this entailment between the equivalence relations over the DFA and over the language. Otherwise, you would keep, if you don't, if you don't satisfy this kind of a condition, that each equivalence class requires a different state, then you are going to lose some strings that are equivalent to each other. You're not going to be able to keep track of these, for example, we are not going to be able to satisfy this condition, right? Because we want, if they are equivalent or not, we want to know it when we process these strings in the finite automaton, OK? So we know that then each equivalence class will require a different state. And one really important insight is that if if this equivalence relation defines, let's say, you know, like k equivalence classes, like k, I don't know, any kind of like a non-negative number, um, then any kind of finite automata that recognizes this language, L, must have at least k states, just because we, we need to satisfy this, this one that is written here, OK? So we define, then, a minimal DFA in the following way. If you have this DFA that recognizes a language, then you can construct the DFA that actually has the number of states, which is exactly equal to this k number of equivalence classes that is defined over the language. OK? So as in this case, for example, you have this, this three-state final automaton that recognizes this language of, um, language of, like for example, the binary strings that are divisible by three. But one thing that you can do is construct some different finite automaton um, it's, it's going to be something like this, I guess. okay this this is going to be i mean we can I can send you like i mean I think it's here, yeah, sorry about that. 
this one on the left hand side. Okay, you can construct this one and it's going to accept the same one, but it's not going to be minimal. Okay, there are some um, ways algorithms that you can use to, for example, construct a minimal DFA when I give you a regular language, vice versa. But we're not going to go into that because I think we don't need that. So again, then the final point is that by my neural theorem of computer science, we know that if I give you a language, a regular language, this minimal DFA that we introduced here, it's going to be unique. Uh, up to isomorphism, which is a basically cooler way of saying that relabeling of the states and just like the state transitions. Okay? So, one thing that is really important is that I think just taking a step back and looking at what we have done or <laughs> what I have tried to do. So, just the perspective. We want to solve problems, computer science, okay? And we want to solve them efficiently. And we introduced this basic computational machine that is called the deterministic finite automata, where, again, as David mentioned, you basically know everything, or most of the things, 99%, okay? And these guys are, they, these guys are capable of great things, okay? For example, with these kind of concepts that we introduced, this language is a set of strings that are recognized by DFAs and so on and so forth. And one thing that we are interested in is to actually start tackling the issues of complexity, computational complexity, okay? Oopsie, what is going on? Okay. So you, you can try to, you know, invest, start investigating time and space complexity and so on and so forth, but actually the complexity class of deterministic finite automata is like a baby computational complexity class. This is P. It's like here, okay? So it's not really interesting. But still, uh, there is something that you can do, and it is to investigate descriptive complexities in terms of the size complexity, which we describe just as the uh, number of states in your minimal DFA, okay? So one thing that we want to do is, again, for engineering aspects or just for fun, I guess, and the you know, theoretical reasons probably from stochastic thermodynamics, what we want to do is to actually ask the questions of what happens to your thermodynamic costs of you know, like just carrying out this computational process in a minimal DFA where you, have, where you don't have redundancy and in a different DFA where you have redundancy, okay? These are the things that we are going to be considering. And I guess this is the things that you need to know to get an intuition about compute. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what, what technology is it to, to discuss in size complexity to make the transition, to take a break? They've it's been... done. No, I'm done. <laughs> so okay, like, yeah. yeah. Okay, excellent. So let's um, all take a break now. Um, five minutes. Um, it's been at it for over an hour. And then I'll start on the Turing machine stuff. And as I mentioned, that will be continued um, uh, continued on next rock, as the uh, story went by R.A. Lafferty, but continue tomorrow morning. Okay?